Good morning. Uh, take some more coffee. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Okay, that's a little better. Uh, and it's a pleasure to be here. I've, I've attended many of these programs in the past, and uh, frankly, the state's a better state due to GPPF and uh, the pressure you put on the legislators to enact good legislation uh, rather than just legislation to get reelected at times. So, uh, certainly appreciate the work. Uh, so I'm here to talk about Papaka in 10 minutes or less, which is sort of a daunting task. <laughs> patient Protection and Affordability Care Act, one that neither protects the patient or provides affordable care. Uh, the bill was uh, signed into law March 23, 2010. Uh, there are now 28 states that have challenged this law. 26 are in the lawsuit were involved in with the NFIB and two individual taxpayers that started in Pensacola. An additional suit was filed late in Oklahoma, and an additional suit was filed promptly in Virginia, but on poor grounds, that being a, pass, a statute that was passed in the state of Virginia, and the court held that it was uh, not appropriate per the Anti-Injunction Act, which you will hear a lot more about this morning. So when I ran, I said that we would join the suit, if you recall, my predecessor didn't think much of the suit, and Governor Perdue joined the suit as the Constitution permits. Uh, Governor Deal agreed that uh, with my desire to enter the, the suit, the caption would change so that it was in the name of the state of Georgia through the Attorney General. And we've been active uh, since. A gentleman in my office, Nels Peterson, who was Governor Purdue's Executive Council, and as our policy guy, is a great, great uh, addition to our office, and he's been the lead for us uh, on the suit. There's four claims in the suit, the individual mandate, the expansion of Medicaid, the health care exchanges, and the employer mandate, which is probably the one you hear the least about. But in Pipaca, it requires large employers to include governments uh, to have a, a minimal level of a benefit package. And this really doesn't get played, but for the state of Georgia, it's significant. For any large employer, it's significant. They're then telling us what coverage we need to provide state employees. That ought to be your decision not the federal government's decision. The lawsuit that we're involved in in Pensacola, we had a great win uh, by Judge Vinson. He declared the individual mandate was unconstitutional. Uh, he didn't rule with us on other issues such as the expansion of Medicaid, but he ruled that the individual mandate was the linchpin of the overall law. Thus, there was no severability and he struck the whole act out. The 11th Circuit, we had two Democrat appointees and one Republican appointee, so it was a tough panel. But two of the three, one R, the only R, and one D, ruled that the individual mandate once again was unconstitutional. More interesting to me was all three of the judges in the 11th Circuit expressed significant concern over the expansion of Medicaid. Now, none of the three ruled in our favor, but they all said in their different opinions that they thought the South Dakota versus Dole case, which deals with when an act of the federal government sufficiently coerces the state government that the state can attack it as unconstitutional, that there had not been sufficient guidance by the court to know at what point they had the authority to rule the act unconstitutional. So all three judges said, look, this case is going up to the Supreme Court in all likelihood. And uh, we would like the Supreme Court to provide further guidance on South Dakota versus Dole, and then we would look forward to, to ruling once again on the expansion of Medicaid argument. So I thought that was really interesting that all three, two Ds, shared our concern with the expansion of Medicaid. As Kelly said, the Supreme Court will hear six hours of argument starting this Monday. Uh, I'll have the privilege of attending the session Monday. Unfortunately, they only gave us they, meaning the Supreme Court, only gave us six seats per day and said some of the original states will be there all three days. I'm lucky to be there at any of the days. So leave Sunday and come back Monday at night for that one. Uh, six hours, uh, there was a case in 1972 that received six hours. For more than six hours, you'd have to go back to 1966, which is the initial case that challenged the Voting Rights Act Section 5 in that regard. So a summary of the law, it requires that all persons with minimal exemptions, exceptions have to obtain health insurance or pay a quote unquote penalty. Severely limits insurance carriers with regard to pre-existing conditions, 
Medicaid is substantially expanded with a great unfunded mandate to us, and exchanges are created. And more importantly than some, it infringes on the doctor-patient relationship. Let's talk a minute or two about cost, something you probably didn't expect me to, to talk about, but you business folks, so you care about cost. Beginning in 2014, Georgia is required to, exchange, to extend that Medicaid eligibility to 133% of the federal poverty level. That will add an additional six, 650 to 750,000 Georgia residents to our Medicaid rolls. Now, we already know that less doctors will accept Medicaid. What happens when we have a 35% increase in the number of Georgians that are then on Medicaid? It is an additional $2.5 billion cost over the decade. Now, President Obama, in uh, promoting PAPACA, said it would cost $900 billion over 10 years, specifically over a trillion, thinking that would cost them some votes. He also said that passage of the act would lower insurance premiums an average of $2,500 per family, $2,500. When PAPACA was signed into law, the CBO initially said it had a cost of $938 billion, or roughly $40 billion more, over 10 years, and it included $575 billion in new taxes, along with cuts. Excuse me, new taxes and $575 billion in cuts to Medicare with an annual deficit of $75 billion on top of that per year. Many of you may have read in the last 10 days the CBO has once again revised their projections. They now estimate that the 10-year cost is not $900 billion, but $1.8 trillion, or a doubling of that. And the Kaiser Family Foundation now states that insurance premiums per family have already risen $2,200 per family rather than the $2,500 decrease the president told us we'd get. CBO originally told us that one million folks would lose employer-sponsored health care, but now they say that will be more like 20 million folks will lose employer-provided coverage at a rate of three to five million a year, and the answer is really simple. If you tell a company they could pay a $2,000 penalty, instead of paying $7,500 or $10,000 to give your employee health insurance, what are most businesses going to do? They're going to write the check for the much lower penalty, and we're going to then get substandard health insurance, one size fits all. Now, going back to the legal issues, there's this thing called the Tenth Amendment, the principle of federalism that provides the powers not granted to the federal government are reserved to the states. And that is a huge part of our lawsuit against the administration. The administration, since they need to cite to a part of the Constitution to make this papaka legal, cites two clauses, the Commerce Clause and the Tax and Spend Clause. The Commerce Clause is just a couple words that says that Congress has the right to regulate commerce with foreign nations, Indian tribes, and among the several states. And in law school, back in the Dark Ages, the, law, the case that we were taught about the Commerce Clause was the Justice Department suing a restaurant in South Carolina for racial discrimination. And they were able to invoke federal jurisdiction because the ketchup in the restaurant was Heinz ketchup. So it came from Pennsylvania and was transported to South Carolina. <laughs> now we all smiled when we read that case, but we got it. There was a truck, it crossed state lines, it was interstate commerce. This, of course, is rather different because here for the very first time, Congress is seeking to invoke the Commerce Clause for the failure to buy a product, or as commonly called, economic inactivity. So that's the huge fight. They base this on two theories, one, economic decisions or decisions with economic consequences, or the timing of activity, and they say if you could regulate it afterwards, then you can regulate it before. I would suggest when you take the economic decisions argument and the timing of activity argument, there is nothing Congress would not then be able to do and the Tenth Amendment would be absolutely worthless under the administration's legal theory. Now let me talk a second about the tax and spend clause. I've mentioned the word penalty several times here because the president and the congressional leadership told us it was a penalty. But when the lawsuit was filed, the Justice Department pled that it was a tax to then incorporate the tax and spend clause. Then they figured out that really wasn't a bright argument. 
because they'd have to deal with the Anti-Injunction Act and they didn't want to go there. But in addition to the lawsuit that we have, the Virginia and Oklahoma, there were a whole bunch of private parties that filed suits challenging Kapaka. And unfortunately, two appellate courts, including the D.C. Circuit, ruled that the case was not ripe based on the Anti-Injunction Act that relates to the Tax and Spend Clause. And the issue is simply that you cannot file a lawsuit on the imposition of a tax before the tax is collected. Now since the tax isn't collected or penalty until January 1, 2014, the theory goes this case has been prematurely brought and you would have to refile it after January 2014. Now the government decided that if you look at Papaka and everything that starts rolling, that they didn't want to have that stay and that they wanted a decision now. So the Justice Department and the states agree on one thing which is the Anti-Injunction Act is not a bar to this case. But the Supreme Court, in rightly noting that two appellate courts ruled that the Anti-Injunction Act did invoke that bar, uh, asked other lawyers to present arguments Monday for the bar. So Monday is the Anti-Injunction Act with other lawyers <coughs> saying that the case uh, is uh, premature. And justice and the state saying, no, the case is ripe, and it should be heard. Tuesday is the expansion of medic, excuse me, is the individual mandate argument solely on the Commerce Clause, where we deal with all the cases from growing uh, wheat for personal consumption, marijuana in the backyard, uh, all that line of cases. Wednesday is the expansion of Medicaid, which deals with South Dakota versus Dole, that I talked about earlier, as well as severability. And the courts have absolutely been everywhere on the severability argument. In Florida, in our case, they ruled that when the individual mandate was unconstitutional, the whole act is unconstitutional. We like Judge Vincent's ruling. The 11th Circuit ruled that the individual mandate was unconstitutional, but that the act was severable. We didn't like that part of the ruling. That would cost states and businesses a substantial amount of money, even without the individual mandate in place. A Pennsylvania district court said, you know, the exact opposite of the other two. So it is everywhere uh, in the appellate courts on that issue. So as we look forward to Monday to Wednesday, everyone can be a pundit. Uh, you go to NPR this morning, someone told me, you look on all the articles, everyone's getting a lot of uh, attention for their opinions with regard to this case. Uh, and you and I both know we won't know the opinion until the end of June. And we won't know where the justices line up until the end of June. Uh, and while we will hope to get an idea of where some of the justices are, specifically Justice Kennedy, and the scope of those arguments Monday to Wednesday, uh, this is definitely one of those times where I presume most people in this room want the whole act thrown out. I certainly do but we're not gonna know the answer to the question until the end of June. I will tell you that our lawyer is Paul Clement. Uh, Paul was Bush 43 Solicitor General. He is a fantastic appellate advocate. He's been in front of the Supreme Court over 80 times. He represented us in the 11th Circuit and did an outstanding job. So we feel very good about who our counsel is and who's uh, making the arguments on behalf of the 26 states. Thank you very much.